بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد المرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه وبارك وسلم تسليما كثيرا إلى يوم الدين أما بعد Let's move on to the next chapter The next chapter is a very long chapter The chapter is moving now on to ex- external aspects so until now, all of the discussion was about the characteristics of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and then things that related to those characteristics. So when you had the discussion on the dying, it was about the hair. The hair is a natural occurrence. You know, you you can't change the way your hair is, in the sense that that's what you're given. Likewise, with the kuhl, it was to do with the eyes. So those were the kind of natural things that a human has. Now we move on to the clothing of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Now this is going to be very interesting because this is again something that we can inshallah try to emulate. It will also uh, clarify a lot of uh, misunderstandings that people may have about certain clothing of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, what exactly he used to dress like, what did he used to prefer and so on. It shows us the kind of boundaries of good and bad clothing as such and so on. Firstly, it's makru for a rich person to wear tatty clothing. For example, if he's got, I mean, if he's given all of his wealth away and has become a pauper, you know, a, a purposeful, voluntary poverty, then that's a different story. But for whatever reason, the person is going around always in tatty clothing, then he's not thanking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for his, uh, for his uh, blessings. On one occasion, Abd, Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah saw somebody with tatty clothing. So he told him to wait until the end of the majlis, until the end of the dars. After everybody had gone, he called him and he said, uh, looked under his musalla, his place, and he pulled out some money. And he said, you know, go, go spend this on yourself, get some decent clothing. Right? So the person said, I don't really need it, I've got money. So then he says, then why are you dressed like this for? To make people feel sorry for you. you know, why why do, would you do that for? So it's not a good idea to do that. So we understand the limits of the type of clothing. The haram clothing would be those where you go and you wear it to show off with. Or silk, which is haram for men, unless it's in one of the valid uses. For example, in a particular battle context. Or if somebody has a disease where only silk would be permitted. Uh, likewise, um, anything else that would be considered effeminate. So those would be impermissible to use for men. So in, in many cases, you've got that kind of a uh, these different boundaries. This chapter is going to deal with that which the Prophet ﷺ used to wear. What kind of quality of clothing? Where was it from? Right. So you'll understand from here is that is it permissible to wear clothing that's made by non-Muslims? I mean, I don't think we can get away with it in this country or in any other country for that matter. Right. It all comes from China anyway. Well, no, not really. Actually, it's made a lot of it is made in Bangladesh. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. Right. You look at your label, it's probably in Bangladesh. Right? Uh, they have some of the biggest factories for Asda, Walmart, and so on and so forth. So in clothing, uh, Bangladesh is really up there. right? Um, China in electronics and everything else, but Bangladesh is doing well. May Allah give them tawfiq to pay more and to look after their... There was a, a woman working in one of those factories in Bangladesh. She, these guys from America, they went and they brought her over to America and took her into Walmart. Walmart is Asda, right? the cheapest of the cheap. Asda is not cheap though, right? But Walmart. So when she saw a pair of clothing, garment that she recognized as one that she had made in her factory, not that particular one, but one of those, and she saw the price, she was just like shocked. It cost more than she would be paid even though it's the cheapest of what we can buy, $10, right? That was way more than what she was being paid for a week or a month or something like that, some, some crazy amount. The main thing that we understand, the conclusion of it, from, le- from looking at and observing the lifestyle of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, what we realize is that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam never strove hard to get the best of clothing, the most refined of it. So you know, like, okay, these are five different types. I'm going to get the best one. He always took the mediocre one in the sense that it wasn't too tatty 
or too worn out or too inferior, neither was it the best. There were cases when he was gifted with the best of clothing, with some, the best of a mixture of silk and wool, for example. But he preferred to give that away to various companions or whatever. So it was brought. On some occasions, he, he may have even worn it once or twice just to prove that it's permissible. But most of the time, his clothing, he did not go and try to push for the most pleasing of it or the most refined of something. And he never tried to get clothing that made him look apart from everybody else in terms of, uh, a sp- I mean, nowadays we'd say like a specific label or something. There, you know, there weren't labels in those days in that sense. But to get something that's just so shiny and dazzling that it sets you apart from everybody else, he never got something like that. And if you, if you look at it, when people, especially people who are not very sensible, when they become wealthy, certain category of individuals, they start getting things that are not necessarily elegant, they just get things which are really bright, which are just really dazzling. And they get loads of them. So you know, they have it all on their fingers and then halfway around their chest. So it's all full. And the garment is really weird and the boots and so on. Right? So that's just kind of like abnormal stuff. The reason is the human being and his outer aspect, it needs to be decent. It needs to be of a quality so that people do not look down upon you. But at the same time, the real respect and honor of a believer is through the taqwa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is the main thing. Not by adopting the best of what's available in the world. And the more that people and communities have, then as people start getting a certain type of car, people start buying and uh, shopping in certain types of places, then others will also do that. Otherwise, what happens is that you be, you, people look down upon you. right? So then you feel you're obliged to do that as well. Especially in certain industries. I have a friend who works in New York, right, in the finance. Uh, he was in banking and so on. And he, t- he tells me, he said, because I know he's not into these refined things but he would insist on going and buying a particular type of tie or a particular type of suit a Calvin Klein it had to be Brooks Brothers or whatever so like he says the reason is that at work if they actually come and check your label meaning they don't come and it's not like okay you all have to be checked today to see what you're wearing but they'll come and they'll kind of say hey that's a really nice tie and then they'll kind of flip it over to see where it's from and if it's from Primark then you're in trouble right in fact, if it's probably from Debenhams, you're in trouble. You know, because you're working in that sector where you expect it to. So even though it looks good, no, the label needs to. They'll come and kind of check, hey, that's a nice shirt. Where is it from? Oh, okay. And then they'll tell everybody. So to avoid being humiliated that way, he'd have to spend certain amounts of money like that to go and buy these kind of things. So then in America, you've got a lot of these shops where they sell all of this designer stuff that's kind of like um, can't be sold elsewhere. So then people go and try to pick it up from there. It's weird. The other thing is that for men in particular, for women, they can get away with adornment and everything. As long as it's not for the sake of glory over somebody else and arrogance. But within women, for them to look nice is just so ingrained except those whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made different. But the majority, that's how they are. There are some men who are more like that, where they're too particular about their clothing. So every few minutes they'll have to check if there's a, um, a, a piece of, you know, a, a thread or something on their clothing and kind of flick it off. And to just make sure everything is creased properly. And to actually, you know, kind of press the crease a bit to make sure it's still there. I mean, subhanAllah. You, so you, you get that crossover in both. So clothing, adornment, refine, and in that it's more of a woman thing. Although it is for, the, for men, it is praiseworthy to have a decent and pure sense of style. That is recommended just to keep you away from the humiliation of people. But it says, Tawassut fi jinsihi. So it's about trying to get the, the middle level, not too much and not too less. So that 
people do not start to humiliate you. Umar radiallahu anhu used to say, Iyakum wa libsatain. Beware or abstain from two types of clothing. Libsatan mashura wa libsatan mahkura. Stay away from clothing that's going to cause you arrogance. That's going to make you famous for your clothing. You know, it's going to be standing out for that. And mahkura. Clothing which is going to cause you humiliation and degradation. So don't be just completely just, you know, I don't care, put anything on and go out. Yes, the Prophet ﷺ did put on garments that were not torn, but they, if they were torn, then they were patched up. So I remember one person, he went out with torn socks. This was in the madrasa. And one of the older students said, well, why you got torn? He says, well, it's sunnah to go around, you know, with. He says, no, the sunnah is to have it patched. So if you can't buy another pair and you have to use this one, fine, but patch it up. Thread doesn't cost that much. right? So going out in tatty, torn is not the point. It's to go out and show, well, I've got nothing, but I'm using this. It's completely fine. So the, the, Umar radiallahu said, stay away from these two extremes. Right, those glory, glory clothing or uh, popa clothing, and one of them said, "Amma ta'am fa kulli nafsika mashtahat, wajal libasaka mashtaha hunnas." As far as food is concerned, eat whatever you want, whatever your nafs wants, eat whatever you want. In the sense that you don't have to worry what somebody else says to you. Right, there's obviously boundaries there as well, but when it comes to your libas and your clothing, then take that which the people would not find weird. And strange, and they would find to be, they would find to be um, acceptable. That's why the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam used to wear. Now, this is where we understand what the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was wearing. Take of the clothing the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam used to wear of the clothing that was the most appropriate clothing of his people, and that was which was the ada of his people. Right, he never restricted himself to just one type of clothing so that it became kind of necessary for everybody to get just that clothing or that he would become known by that particular type of clothing but whatever was vogue in those days that's what he wore that's why when we living in a western country and wearing you know casual clothing like a shirt and a and a bottom as long as it's uh, shirts and and pants or trousers as long as they're concealing, they would not be anything uh, haram or wrong or makru tahrimi even to wear that. It would only become makru tahrimi if it's really tight or anything of that nature, which would be makru tahrimi even in a jubba. Because now if you look at some of these new urban jubbas, right, even the way they're promoted is so weird. right? And you can tell anybody who's wearing one of those urban jubbas, they are especially the really tacky ones. So the Prophet ﷺ did that. Now, when you come to the masjid, normally people like to wear... Muslims have a very unique kind of presence. I think this needs to be discussed. Because number one, we're living in a... Muslims in the West, we're living in a country where the normal kind of attire is jeans and uh, you know slacks and um, a top and a t-shirt or a, a shirt. Right? Or in a more formal setting, a suit. Those things are not impermissible to wear for those who have to be in that setting to wear them. Right? There's nothing wrong with that. Then we've got the masjid environment, the Muslim community environment, which alhamdulillah we've got. So that is then becomes a kind of a sub-environment for us. Right? So and there's nothing that, that's completely fine. That's our clothing. So we've got people around us wearing that. There's an abundance of that. So that's completely fine. So we don't want to go to an extreme where we said, well, we have to dress like a person who's not a Muslim. And we must look down upon the Islamic so-called dress. Because at the end of the day, most of the Islamic dress that people are wearing is Saudi dress, Indian dress, Pakistani dress, Malaysian dress, Turkish dress. That's essentially what it is, isn't it? What is Islamic dress? There are certain boundaries for what an Islamic dress is. 
as you learn from some of these hadith, the Prophet is saying, or the Sahaba are saying that the most common feature of Rasulullah's clothing was a qamis. He liked the qamis, which is like a jubba. There's a description of that jubba, jubba right? That used to be down to up to half his shanks, uh, half the uh, uh, between the knees and the and the toes, uh, the knees and the and the, and the ankles, and so on and so forth. And the, it will tell us exactly how how long it used to be, how many buttons he had. All of these things will be mentioned. Yet he wore other types of garments as well. So I think in here we've, mashallah, we have this other culture which is from the and the the point of it is that just in comparison to the clothing of the West in general, which is a shirt and uh, trousers in general, and whether you call it the Punjabi dress or the, um, the decent Punjabi dress, right? the decent Punjabi dress, the Saudi, the, the Indian, the Malaysian, all of this is kind of longer than the normal Western dress. It's more concealing. So that's why it's more Islamic. Because they came from an, a country where majority Muslims. It came from a country where it's majority Muslims. So that's why we would say it's more Islamic because you'd, un, you'd expect that if it's Muslims who are adopting this from their heritage, then it's going to be more fulfilling of the kind of general recommendation of the Prophet's dress. Having said that, once when I asked a scholar as to what exactly would be considered the Sunnah dress, that people should observe today. So we're going to discuss this a lot more as we go through that exactly how was the qamis of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and you can actually see a picture of it. The, the a qamis of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam actually exists in the Top Kapi Museum, but it's not on public display. It's only put on display a few days or a few uh, on few occasions because it's wrapped up in a special box and so on. I mean, because it is, you can understand, fourteen hundred years old. And subhanAllah, when you, I'll try to bring a picture of it. What it is, is it's of this kind of, it seems like it has two, uh, it has an outer and an inner lining. And it's, the outer one is of a coarse kind of cloth. Kind of dark greenish, uh, brownish kind of uh, khaki style color. And there's one button. So the neck is, is smaller than the normal ones, that the normal Saudi thobes has maybe four buttons. That one only has one button. Right, and um, th there are some people I know today who who've tried to make make that, and that's all they wear that kind of a style. So when I asked one of the teachers as to what would you consider the sunnah, this is what they said. They said the sunnah dress in any country you go to would be the dress of the ulama, of the of the pious ulama of the area, because they're the representatives of the prophets. So for example, if you go to Turkey. They don't wear thobes like the Arabs do, or like they, the the kurta shalwar kameez. They don't they don't wear that kind of stuff. They've got these kind of uh, long, uh, what would you call them? Long tunics that are buttoned up in the front. So they, it's different. But they they and then they've got the baggy trousers. So that's really important. The baggy trousers are very important. It's a men issue. The men it's the difficulties with the men for the women. They just throw a whole garment on the top and that's in, they, they're all fine, as long as it's not attractive. And inside they can wear whatever they want. So it's a men have a more of a, uh, men have more of a kind of a challenge with as to what exactly is sunnah. So inshallah we'll be studying more of that. I'm just going to read one of these ahadith for the barakah of the chapter and then inshallah we'll carry on with it next week. وبالإسناد المتصل منا إلى الإمام الترمذي قال باب ما جاء في لباس رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم وبه قال حدثنا محمد بن حميد الرازي قال حدثنا الفضل بن موسى وأبو ثمي وأبو تميلة وزيد بن حباب عن عبد المؤمن بن خالد عن عبد الله بن بريدة أم سلمة رضي الله عنها قالت كان أحب الثياب إلى رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم القميص سليتر من أم سلمة رضي الله عنها she says that the most beloved garment to Rasulullah was the qamis. And the qamis is essentially a top garment that is shaped in the, in, in the, uh, according to the limbs of the body. As opposed to, for example, a shawl. Because the Prophet also sometimes just used the top garment and a lungi. What you call izar and rida. Rida is the kind of, you know, in the, uh, in the ihram, what you wear, the two pieces of clothing, 
Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi used to also wear that kind of a clothing sometimes. But then he preferred the qameez for a particular reason. Because you don't have to manage it. Once you put it on, it's on. If you're using any other kind of garment, which you, don't, which you have to kind of keep closed, hold on to, make sure it doesn't fly away, make sure it doesn't drop off. The reason he preferred the qameez was that it was the most manageable and the easiest of the garments and at the same time the most covering. Because with any, uh, anything else, if it drops off because you have to do something, because you have to hold something else, then you can reveal part of your body. Right? So that's why he liked the qameez the most. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. وبال إسناد المتصل منا إلى الإمام الترمذي قال باب ما جاء في لباس رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم وبه قال حدثنا محمد بن حميد الرازي قال حدثنا الفضل بن موسى وأبو تميلة وزيد بن حباب عن عبد المؤمن بن خالد عن عبد الله بن بريدة أم سلمة رضي الله عنها قالت كان أحب الثياب إلى رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم القميص وبه قال حدثنا علي بن حجر قال حدثنا الفضل بن موسى عن عبد المؤمن بن خالد عبد الله بن بريدة أم سلمة رضي الله عنها قالت كان أحب الثياب إلى رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم القميص وبه قال حدثنا زياد بن أيوب البغدادي قال حدثنا أبو تميلة عن عبد المؤمن بن خالد عن عبد الله بن بريدة عن أمه عن أم سلمة رضي الله عنها قالت كان أحب الثياب إلى رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم يلبسه القميص قال كان قال هكذا قال زيد بن أيوب في حديثه عن عبد الله بن بريدة أمه عن أم سلمة وهكذا روى غير واحد عن أبي تميلة مثل رواية زياد بن أيوب وأبو تميلة يزيد في هذا الحديث عن أمه وهو أصح وبه قال حدثنا عبد الله بن محمد بن الحجاج قال حدثنا معاذ بن هشام قال حدثني أبي عن بدين يعد بن ميسرة العقيلي عن شهر بن حوشب عن أسماء بنت يزيد قالت كان كم قميص رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم إلى الرزغ وبه قال حدثنا أبو عمار الحسين بن حريث قال حدثنا أبو نعيم قال حدثنا زهير عن أروة بن عبد الله بن قشير عن معاوية بن قرة عن أبيه قال أتيت رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم في رهت من مزينة لنبايعه وإن قميصه لمطلق أو قال زر قميصه مطلق قال فأدخلت يدي في جيبه جيب قميصه فمسست الخاتمة وبه قال حدثنا عبد بن حميد قال حدثنا محمد بن الفضل قال حدثنا حماد بن سلمة حبيب بن الشهيد عن الحسن عن أنس بن مالك رضي الله عنه أن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم خرج ويتكئ على أسامة بن زيد عليه ثوب قطري قد توشح به فصلى بهم وقال عبد بن حميد قال محمد بن الفضل سألني يحيى بن معين عن هذا الحديث أول ما جلس إلي فقلت حدثنا حماد بن سلمة به فقال لو كان من كتابك فقمت لأخرج كتابي فقبض على ثوبي ثم قال أمله علي فإني أخاف أن لا ألقاك قال فأمليته علي ثم أخرجت كتابي فقرأت عليه وبه قال حدثنا سويد بن نصر قال حدثنا عبد الله بن مبارك عن سعيد بن, إي عن سعيد بن إياس الجريري عن أبي نظرة عن أبي سعيد الخطر رضي الله عنه قال كان رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم إذا استجد ثوبا سماه باسمه ثم يقول اللهم لك الحمد كما كسوتنيه أسألك خيره وخير ما سنع له وأعوذ بك من شره وشر ما سنع له وبه قال حدثنا هشام بن يونس الكوفي قال حدثنا القاسم بن مالك المزني عن الجريري عن أبي نظرة عن أبي سعيد الخدري عن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم نحوه وبه قال حدثنا محمد بن بشار قال حدثنا معاذ بن هشام قال حدثني أبي إن قتالة عن أنس بن مالك رضي الله عنه قال كان أحب الثياب إلى رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم يلبسه الحبارات number of narrations but three of them for example are the same Imam Tirmidhi just brings them for a small addition in one of them so as we discussed last time this chapter is about the different aspects related to the clothing of Rasulullah صلى الله عليه وسلم as we mentioned last time, the Prophet ﷺ wasn't on the lookout for fine cloth, for fine clothing, refined clothing, the best of clothing. He was really very casual about what he wore. Though uh, in some situations he did wear uh, very expensive clothing. If it came to him, he would wear it for a very short period of time and then maybe he'd give it out to somebody. That's why it mentions that the Prophet ﷺ used to wear a number of different types of clothing that have come 
uh, in the ahadith, as we'll see later. Uh, on many cases, uh, in many cases, it used to be maybe a kind of a. Uh, in many cases, what he used to keep behind was things made of cotton. Uh, normally, shawls. He would wear the upper garment like a shawl, like a, a wrap. That was something he wore sometimes. He also wore an izar, which is uh, a lungi, a sarong, a uh, lower garment. Well, you know, that is not necessarily uh, sewn. It's just a garment, like in ihram, like the two pieces of ihram. And yet, you find in numerous places he wore a qamis. Numerous places mentioned he wore a qamis. And then there's certain types of cloth that are mentioned. It seems like m many of the cloth that are mentioned, they came from Yemen. Maybe Yemen was a big producer of cloth in those days. So there were two different types of cloth, as we'll see. One was slightly slightly rough, and the other one was like very soft, very soft like silk. It wasn't silk, it was made of cotton, but it used to be made very soft. And that's mentioned, and they're both from Yemen, uh, the Qitri and the, the other one. So the Hibar. So it may be that good cloth came from Yemen at that time. The Prophet ﷺ, many occasions, if good, um, it says, يُقْسِمُ أَقْبِيَةَ الْخَزِّ الْمُخَوَّصَةِ بِالذَّهَبِ فِي صَحْبِهِ هَذَا هُوَ الْغَالِبِ مِنْ حَالِهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَمُ What that means, according to what this commentator is saying, is that sometimes he would receive good silk, or a silken type of cloth, or just a very good piece of cloth, he would normally distribute that among the companions. They can use it for the uh, purposes that were permissible, or the women companions. Uh, even sometimes he received cloth, uh, this very uh, expensive, maybe silken cloth, that was uh, adorned, uh, ornamented with, with gold and thread. He's even received something like that, which he would just give away. He never kept the good things for himself, you know, maybe for a rainy day, he will wear this on a special occasion. Prophet Sallallahu was very casual in his dress. The first hadith, it's uh, hadith number 54 of the book. It's related from um, Abdullah ibn Buraida from Ummu Salama radiyallahu anha. This was the wife of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Her name, Ummu Salama, was obviously her agnomen, her title. Her name was Hind. She says that the most beloved type of garment or clothing to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa was the qamis. Qamis is essentially something that is sewn for the top part of the body. That is primarily for the top part of the body. That's a qamis. A qamis could be a short qamis, like a shirt. It could be a longer qamis, like the jubba the jillabiyya, etc. that we have nowadays. Now, it will give a description of exactly how uh, or kind of how his qamis looked like. But there was a reason why he preferred a qamis over, for example, the shawl, even though on numerous occasions you hear that the Prophet ﷺ raised his hand so high that we could see the whiteness of his armpits or that his shawl fell off. So either the sleeves were very very wide and that's why you could see or there was just a shawl and it fell off. So the Prophet ﷺ would wear different things and in a hot country like that you could get away with wearing just a shawl in that case. And you could probably also, and there's no excuse for us to have more than one pair of clothing, but you could also probably get away with just having one pair of clothing. Because you could wash it, put it back on, Go outside and it's dry. You don't have to sit around waiting for it to dry. Like in ihram, when people go for ihram, especially if it's hot, they run in, take a shower, put the ihram back on, go out, and it's all fine. Right? So, wallahu alam, in the cold days, obviously, that was difficult. And there were times when some of the khulafa came late because they only had one garment and it wasn't dry enough, or it wasn't, you know, it took a while to wash or to dry. And that's why they came late for Jumu'ah, for example. There are, we do hear of incidents like that as well. So what is essentially, you know, everybody in their mind will have a different concept of qamis. So how is qamis described in the books of philology, in the books of uh, language, the dictionaries and lexicons and so on? So essentially, firstly, it says, ahabu thiyab, the best of clothing. 
thiab is the plural of thobe. Thobe just means anything that a person would wear that's made of cotton or wool or silk or of any other material. There, were, there weren't as many artificially manufactured materials like nylon and polyester and all of these. These are all plastics, right? M many of our clothing nowadays is artificially man-made from petroleum. It's plastics, even though it doesn't seem like it at all. Some say that this refers to only cotton material, not wool. And it is, that's what's indicated in this hadith, that the Prophet ﷺ preferred cotton over wool. Although people used wool in those days because it was something that you could get off the sheep and so on. So it was uh, readily available. But the, the reason he, uh, he, the Prophet ﷺ preferred wool, is uh, preferred cotton, is because wool was something that would cause more perspiration because it's it retains it's more insulating and and then after that it also takes on the smell and thus it's something which the prophet sallallahu didn't like for that reason because he was very pure uh, his uh, nature was very pure in that sense Dimyati has related that the qameez of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was made of cotton and it was short in its length which means it wasn't all the way down to the floor or down to the feet but it was short in its length it was short both in its length and in its sleeve if you've got a long qameez it can only be two lengths one is down to the floor and the other is about the sleeves so both in its sleeves and in its length it was short so it wasn't to the end, it wasn't up to the fingers, for example, to the tips of the fingers, it wasn't up to the ankles. And we know from other ahadith that the Prophet ﷺ would like to keep his garment, the lower garment, up to uh, half the sh calves, which means that the upper garment couldn't have been lower than that either, if that was the case of the lower garment. It's related from Aisha radiallahu anha, that the Prophet ﷺ never left something from lunch time for supper time, from supper time to lunch time. It wasn't something you think about. Subhanallah. Nowadays, mashallah, we've got two, three months sorted. Inshallah, we'll never have a siege and we'll never have to ration. May Allah protect us from that kind of, any kind of difficulty. But if it did happen, we'd probably sort it for three months with the big freezers and everything that we have, mashallah. May Allah be thanked for that. Also, he never had two qameez at one time, unless it just came in, maybe he gave it away, or no two izars or two rida, which means no two upper garments or lower garments. Likewise, he never had two pairs of footwear either. And the reason the qameez was the most beloved to him, as explained, is because it is the most concealing of the body. It's the most concealing of the body because it's stitched. It's not just loose piece of clothing that you have to kind of wrap around you and hope it stays on or manage it. As opposed to the izar and rida, which means as opposed to like the ihram kind of clothing where you have to keep managing it. Even if you're a professional, you still have to manage it. Right? Um, because it doesn't require any kind of tying or anything. It's there. You put it on and it's there. It's not going to be suddenly fall off you because people we do different activities we use our hands our arms we raise them we have to do different things and that's why it's the most practical piece of clothing and that's why he used to use that so it's the least in terms of maintenance and to manage and it's also light on the body to deal with it's also something which is far older and more ancient than from Rasulullah time it's actually mentioned in the Quran if you remember in Yusuf alayhi salam, in Surah Yusuf, it speaks about the qameez that he sent to his father, Ya'qub alayhi salam, when he discovered that he had lost his eyesight. And this qameez was taken back to Ya'qub alayhi salam and he regained his eyesight. And there's many theories about exactly how that worked, but it's definitely some form of miracle. That's why some have mentioned, and this is not necessarily uh, authentic, uh, that this qameez was originally that had belonged to the great great grandfather of Yusuf alayhi salam, Ya'qub alayhi salam, Ishaq alayhi salam, meaning Ibrahim alayhi salam, Khalil, Khalilullah. It actually belonged to him and been 
um, had been brought down, Yusuf السلام, had it somehow, and he sent that back to Yaqub السلام. Allah knows best. Right, the next, the next narration is also from Umm Salama radiallahu anha, slightly different, different chain, but again she says the same thing, that the Prophet sallallahu most beloved type of garment, clothing, was the qamis. And then you've got hadith number 56, which is the third hadith of the chapter, which is related from Umm Salama radiallahu anha again. In here, again, it's a very similar hadith, except that there's one additional word in some places, that the most beloved clothing that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would wear is the qamis. Just to clarify that it's not the best cloth, it, was, it wasn't the most beloved cloth that he may, he may have used for maybe a veil on the door or to put down or to sleep on or it was to wear the, the, the most appropriate the most beloved the most liked by him Rasulullah was the qamis then Imam Tirmidhi does have some comments there which I won't go into because it's related to the chain we then look at the next hadith which is hadith number 57 which is related from Ibn Maysara, Al Uqayli from Shahr ibn Hawshab, from Asma bint Yazid, radiallahu anha. The Ansari, she was an Ansari, she was from the Ansar, Sahabiya, she has a number of ahadith narrations. Asma bint Yazid, not the sister of Aisha, radiallahu anha. That's Asma bint Abi Bakr. Asma bint Yazid, not that Asma. She relates that the sleeve of the Qamis of Rasulullah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, was up to the wrists. We could call this qamis a tunic, especially the length that Rasulullah was more of a tunic than a shirt, because a tunic is a bit longer, it gives an impression that it's longer. So the sleeve of his tunic was up to his wrists. It says up to the wrists. Now, what exactly does that mean, including the wrist, before the wrist? We don't know, we can't say, because that's not clarified. However, that is the best possible meaning here. Because otherwise it's going to be longer or it's going to be shorter. So you'd rather take the middle meaning, which is that it was up to the wrists. It's probably the best way to understand this narration according to the commentators. Also, the other thing is that if it was longer and it covered the, the fingers as well, then that would be a source of difficulty because you have to then keep pulling it up. I mean, think about it. Even when you've got it just up to your wrist, sometimes you have to put it up. If you've got it over your fingers, you have to use your fingers. You know, people are not sitting there lazy. They're doing things. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa would need to use it. So that's why it can't be up to there. It would actually be preventive from movement and uh, activity and things like that. So it's, it's more that it would be up to the wrists. And if it was less than the wrists, now it's kind of very strange here when it gets hot people take off as much as possible, right? And then they put an artificial cover on there, which is sunblock, sunscreen, right? Uh, these, um, what is it, these creams and things. You go to Arabia, they've got shawls on. So they've got more on. They've got these long tunics, then they've got shawls on the head as well. But obviously they, they can understand, right now. you're using cotton, if you're using polyester is very bad for the heat because it doesn't breathe as well whereas cotton does and using a lighter color which allows the, the light to be reflected so it's kind of very weird here where it gets hot in the few days of the year or maybe more so now and suddenly it's all the opposite so now based on that understanding if the sleeve was shorter than the wrist it means then that part of the hand would be exposed to the elements the sun and so on so that's why the best understanding is that it should be up to the wrists and that's probably what this narration is referring to as well so there's a dalil in here that the sunnah would not be to make your sleeves longer than your wrists so what we have is imam suyuti relates from ibn abbas an, that he used to wear a qamis and it used to be above 
the, the qameez used to be above the ankles and its sleeves used to be covering the, the fingers. So why was Abdullah ibn Abbas عنه, wearing something like that? So some have said that it depends now. Sometimes if you're on a journey, you might need longer ones just to be protected, which you can bring up. But when you're at home, you need it shorter because you're not going to need it because you've got your house to be in anyway. Or it's that he had different types of qamis. Wallahu alam. Or it's also possible that the person thought that it was including the, maybe it was the position of his hands or something like that. It's related from Ali radiallahu anhu that once he bought a qamis, he purchased a qamis, and he told the tailor that he, he should, it was very long, the sleeves were very long, so he told the tailor to cut off the extra part and leave it just up to the wrists. The part covering the fingers he told him to get rid of. So that gives us an understanding that it should not be beyond that. The sunnah is to leave it up to the wrists only. Another thing is uh, Ibn Sha'ban relates that you shouldn't have very tight sleeves. In, in their width, they should be wide. They should be more on the wider side. They shouldn't be tight. And in fact, it seems like it was a social issue of the time. That if anybody came with tight sleeves, it just looked weird. And maybe a certain type of people, a group of people used to have tighter sleeves. The funky people of the area maybe. That's why what it seems, and I don't know, what is it today? It depends, right? Um, like if you have touch, a tight shirt sleeves, it'd be kind of weird, isn't it? It's more of a woman thing nowadays. But Shurayh, the, the famous Qadi, I'm sure you've heard of Shurayh, the, the famous Qadi. Once there was a case and somebody summoned a particular individual to give testimony. The person came in with some garment on that had tight sleeves. And Shurayh said that you can't stand in court. You're not worthy enough. So that means it gives us an understanding that the social situation at the time was that tight sleeves were a kind of a strange thing for men to wear at least. In fact, Imam Malik said that it's actually abusive to have, it's an abuse of the, of the style of clothing to have short sleeves. Wallahu alam. So it seems a very social kind of thing. The next hadith is hadith number 58. It's related from Muawiyah ibn Qurra who relates from his father, who says that I came to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in a group of people, a delegation, come to visit Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This group was from the Muzayna tribe. So he was part of that tribe. He was part of that group. He came to visit Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Why? To give bay'ah, to pledge allegiance. And they were just entering. And he made an observation so he must have come, held the Prophet's hand to make the bay'ah. So he observed and he says that the Prophet's qamis was the buttons were open. Or the button was open. So the word is wa inna qamisahu la mutlakun. That his qamis was open, buttoned, or opened. Right? So if it's the Prophet did not if it was a long tunic, he didn't have buttons all the way down, he only had a button at the top, as we understand from some other sources. Inshallah will bring you a picture uh, of one remnant of the Prophet's garment, which is from Turkey. Or the Sahabi relates that he said, Zirru qamisihi mutlakun. The button, not the, the button, but the thing by which you tie. And those are normally uh, not the plastic buttons as we have them today. These are, you must have seen on these Umani or these Khaliji uh, jubbas that you get or the Moroccan jubbas where you have like a, a ball that's made up of thread and then you have the loop so it's probably something like that right so it's made of the same kind of cloth so he says that yes that tie we can call it a tie that was open of the qamis of Rasulullah that was open so we can understand from this that the, one of the reasons may have been hot he left it open Right? Whatever the reason was, they left it open. So is it good for people to leave their buttons open when they go somewhere? It depends on why you're doing it. If you're going there to you know, pose and show your chest, then clearly there's a, an, an element of uh, showing off there. Right? So it depends on if it's hot and you do it, it's okay. It needs to be obviously within reason. It needs to be obviously within reason. It's a, it'll be a social issue. Is it acceptable 
decent or not. And that's really what, what it's all about. So he's one of the later narrators who can't remember if the Sahabi said that the garment was open or that the, the button, the, the tie of it was open. He can't remember exactly. So either way, he may, it was something that he made an observation of. It's also related to another hadith from Abdullah ibn Yunus and Hassan ibn Musa from Zuhair. Same thing, without a shak as well. Then this narrator's name is Muawiyah ibn Qurra. His father is the one who visited Rasulullah. Muawiyah then was probably young. Urwa says, who's a later narrator, Urwa says that I, ha I never saw Muawiyah or his father ever with their buttons closed. So it seems like this is something they observed from Rasulullah and since then they never closed their buttons. They just emulated that. So he says, I've never seen them with their buttons closed. They've always had it open. Whether it was, uh, it was winter or it was summer. Now, we don't know because the hadith, the wording in the hadith is a bit ambiguous as to whether he said it was just open, which means you know it was kind of open at the top, the, the part that, what do you call this part? The neck of it, right? Or that there was a button was left open. So did it have a button or not? We can't be sure because of the ambiguity in the words. That's why the commentator is saying that we don't even know if his opening by the chest had a button on there or not and a loop, if it had it or not. It's possible that he didn't. They, he just didn't have it there. Although we, we do see in the image of the one that is said to be the garment of Rasulullah that there, was a, there is a loop on there. In fact, Ibn al-Jawzi has related from Ibn Umar radiallahu an that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam never had a qamis in which there was a button. So it may not be as strong, but we do, re we do see that that's a possibility, that he just didn't have a button. That's a possibility, or that he didn't know about the other one. Then um, Qurra, Muawiyah ibn Qurra, Qurra is the father, radiallahu an, he says that because the garment was open, I put my hand into the opening, of his garment and I touched the khatam I touched the seal so wallahu alam I mean we didn't it's difficult for us to say exactly that how wide it was or how loose it was but I guess it was as loose that Muawiyah ibn Qurra sorry Qurra the father felt comfortable enough to put his hand and touch it he doesn't describe whether he asked permission or not or what the situation was or somebody else did it as well and maybe that's why he did it. We don't know. But clearly it's something that he wasn't told off for. Something he did, you know, bold enough to do it or he just felt comfortable enough to do it to feel the khatam. Wallahu alam. That, that's the seal. That's the seal we spoke about earlier. That obviously also proves that it was quite wide. It was loose. It was open. <coughs> And the reason, I mean, the whole purpose of these splits, or slits rather, is to make it easy for the head to, uh, the cloth to go over the head. Most of the time, these are on the, sh uh, on the chest. This is normally made on the chest. For women, it's at the back. And for men, it's normally in, on the chest that you have this. And sometimes it also happens horizontally across one of the, um, one of the shoulders. Or in these other weird designs, as you see in these new, new urban jubbas, in diagonally and you know all these weird ways, it doesn't really matter w what it is. Whatever is normal and acceptable, it's all fine. the The whole thing is that it's there for a practical purpose. So if you want to make that into a style, well, you know, then it's up to your knee to do that. But with the Prophet ﷺ, it seems that it was on the chest. Sometimes the word jab is also used for a pocket that was. The pockets in those days were not necessarily sewn on top. The pockets were actually another piece of cloth, it seemed, that was attached either to the inside of this slit. So the pocket was inside the slit, essentially. Or it was sometimes there was something in the sleeve. So there were either long sleeves, wide sleeves rather, they would carry something in the sleeve, or they would have a pocket that was on the inside of the slit on the chest I actually found a jubba like that that was uh, in, in Fez in Morocco there was a, a one shop that had these jubbas it was this father and son mashallah they were uh, very seemed very religious 
and they designed this specifically. I'm not sure from where, but they designed it and it came up halfway up to the calves and it had short sleeves. If it had long, longer sleeves, it would have been, I think, probably better. But then it had the, it's got these pockets inside on both sides. The next hadith is hadith number 59 which is related from Anas ibn Malik radiyallahu an that once the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam this was most likely referring to the final days of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa life when he was ill he says that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam left his house while he was taking support with Usama ibn Zayd radiyallahu an Usama ibn Zayd radiyallahu an so he came out of the house holding on to or taking support leaning on Usama ibn Zayd radiyallahu an. So that is part of the hadith. But what he wants to say, Anas radiyallahu an say is, وَعَلَيْهِ ثَوْبٌ قِتْرِيٌ That on that occasion, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had a kitri clothing on. I'll explain what that garment is, a kitri garment. Uh, firstly, this Usama ibn Zayd radiyallahu an, I'm sure most of us are aware of him. He was the son of the freed slave of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Zayd radiyallahu an. His mother was Ummu Ayman, another freed slave of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Very beloved to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, both of them. And also the son was very beloved to Rasulullah, uh, the son which is Usama radiallahu anhu was very beloved to him. And he made him the Amir of the, the, the final army that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had set up before he passed away. And he was only, he was less than 20 years old. And in that army was Abu Bakr and Umar radiallahu anhu. So you can see see his position and the trust the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had on him. It says that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, there's, a, there's another narration which gives us this in more detail from Anas radiallahu an, that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was sick, was ill at that time. He came out and he was holding on to Usama radiallahu an. And most likely this is referring to the last illness that he had. Because there's a narration in Dara Qutni which says that he came out of the house between Usama ibn Zayd and Fadl ibn Abbas. This is the brother of Abdullah ibn Abbas, an, the other son of Abbas, an, Fadl. Fadl, Kuthm, they were two or three famous brothers. Uh, not as famous as Abdullah ibn Abbas, but Fadl ibn Abbas. So he came out and he led the companions, and this was one of the last prayers that they performed. Imam Bukhari relates from Abdullah ibn Abbas an, that the Prophet وسلم, came out during his terminal illness. And he was wrapped up in a milhafa. He was wrapped up in a kind of a, a shawl-like. So at that time he was probably not wearing a qamis. Or maybe if he was, he had a shawl on top. So this is, a, this is the description of the shawl and where that shawl was from. Right. It says, mutawashihan. This, sorry, before we discuss that. It was Qitr. Qitr is a place in Yemen. It's an area in Yemen called Qitr with a ta, qaf ta ra. And that's why they call the cloth Qitri cloth because it's made in, in that area. And that's the way traditionally it used to be. You know, nowadays you've got one big factory. Well, even, that happens here as well. If somebody opens a factory, for example, you've got bed factories up in uh, Yorkshire. So you probably one somebody started, somebody else starts another one, somebody else starts another one. So it, it kind of even in modern day that works. You go into any certain, uh, like for example, you go to Turkey, there's a city, there, a little town or whatever called Isparta, right? And it's all famous for rose. So rose, essence, rose, perfume, rose this, rose that, everything is rose, right? It's just like the whole industry is about that. So likewise, you've got here Qitr, place where they're all making this special kind of garment. What it was, it was these shawls that used to be brought from there. So these were not kameez, these were shawls. These were special shawls from there. They had a bit of reddish color. So it was either red color or it had lines of red in there. That was typical. So this you'll see in different areas as well that they have a particular type of cloth. It's going to look like a particular. You've seen the lungis that come from South India, right? They all look the same. They all have the same kind of pattern. Scotland has its tartan, for example. It's that kind of a thing. So it used to have some, it used to have some design on it and it was a reddish color. Now, the, the texture of this was that it was slightly rough. This was a shawl at the end of the day. It wasn't a fine piece of cloth as such. It was a shawl. It had a slight, slight roughness. Not too much, slight roughness. So that's the kind of cloth he had. Maybe it was, it was warm or something. And that's why he had it on. I don't know if they make Qatari cloth. I don't know if this place 
in Yemen and so on. Maybe it might be a good idea to check it out to follow the Sunnah. So قَدْ تَوَشَّحَ بِهِ He had wrapped it around him. Some have said that, no, this is a special way of wrapping around. You know like the way you wrap your ihram around when you do idtija in ihram for the men, where you put it from under your right arm and you throw it over your left arm. It's, that is the way he had it on according to this description. That's the way the Prophet ﷺ had this cloth on when he came out. And then he led them in prayer, Rasulullah wasallam. Ibn Sa'd relates from another chain from Anas radiallahu an, that this was the last salat that the Prophet ﷺ performed uh, or led the, led the congregation during that illness. And he, he had that one garment which was uh, placed over his left shoulder in that way. And he prayed sitting down. The others were standing. He prayed sitting down. And again, Imam Tirmidhi has some comments to make here. That Abd ibn Humayd said, that Muhammad ibn al-Fadl said, Yahya ibn Ma'in asked me, a very interesting point here. Yahya ibn Ma'in, famous hadith scholar. So Yahya ibn Ma'in asked me, meaning asked me, Muhammad ibn al-Fadl is saying, he asked me that the first time that I sat with him, this is my first meeting with him, he said to me that, tell us, uh, he asked me about this hadith. The first time he met me, he asked me about this hadith. So I said, Hamad ibn Salama is the one who's related this. So this is uh, not Sahabi level, this is uh, below. Tabi'in, tabu'ud tabi'in. So I told him, yes, Hamad ibn Salama has related it. So he says, can you relate it to me? Before I was able to relate the whole hadith, he says, can you get your kitab where you've, got, where you've written it so that you can read it out from there for me to be more accurate. So I just got up. I was about to go and get my kitab, my book, and then he grabbed my clothing and he said, no, hold on. Just say it to me. Dictate it to me straight away from your memory. Because I have a fear that I won't meet you again. Kind of strange statement on the face of it. I won't meet you again. So I dictated it to him straight away. Then I went out, got my kitab, my book, and then I read it to him from the book as well. And it was the same. So essentially what's happening here is that he must have come from very far to meet him. And he, he was the anticipation to listen to this hadith was so great. The first he said, I want it accurate, so make sure you get it from your kitab. But then he changed my mind and said, no, something might happen to you in these few minutes. So just say it to me first. Relate it to, to me from memory. I'll write it down or I'll take it. And then after that, you can get it and then confirm it afterwards. So that's just one of the anecdotes we find about these kind of things. Right, so this next hadith, which is hadith number 60, is related from Abu Sa'id al-Khudri radiyallahu an, famous sahabi as, as we've heard of him before, that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, now this is something very practical, this is not just this description, this is something that we can all do, and there's great fa'ida in this. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, idha stajadda thawban, whenever he would take on a new clothing, whenever he was about to use a new garment, Sammahu bi ismihi. He would first take its name. Imamatan aw qamisan aw ridaan. Whether that was a new imama or a qamis or a shawl. Whatever it was, he would first take its name and then he would say, he would read, Allahumma lakal hamdu. O Allah, for you is all praise. Kama kasawtanihi. As you have given me this to wear. As you have given me this to wear. So now, and then, أَسْأَلُكَ خَيْرَهُ وَخَيْرَ مَا سُنِعَ لَهُ وَأَعُوذُ بِكَ مِنْ شَرِّهِ وَشَرِّ مَا سُنِعَ لَهُ I ask you for its good, the good for which it was made. I seek refuge from its evil and from the evil for which it may have been made. So very comprehensive dua. So that's, that's the narration. What is, how is this exactly happening? Firstly, Whenever the Prophet ﷺ would get a new garment, somebody gave him a new garment, he purchased a new garment, a new cloth came for him and he was about to use that instead he'd given the other one away or however it was. Firstly, there's a hadith that's related from Ibn Hibban, from Anas radiallahu an. And again, this is something we can put into action. You do shopping online, you get these, you know, your new clothing or you go and you buy your clothing from wherever you, you're getting them, right? Keep it until Friday. Wear it on Friday. 
the first time you wear it. Because according to this narration of Ibn Hibban from Anas radiallahu an, whenever the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa would get a new cloth to wear, a new garment to wear, he would do it on Friday. Right? So that's the sunnah to wear a new garment on Friday. Start wearing a new garment on Friday. How he would wear it? He would take it and it says he would call it by its name. Not give it a name. He didn't have pet names for his cloth. As he did have though for his sword and for his animals, for his mounts, he had names for them because they don't, you know, you need to distinguish, you can't just say horse, horse, you know. You need to distinguish, bring that horse or bring that sword. He only had one very minimal clothing anyway, so why are you going to give that a name? That's So what he means here is that he would say, it seems that this is attached to the dua. That Allahumma lak alhamdu kama kasawtanihi. All praises to you Allah because you've given me this to wear. Some say that he would take the name of that, like this imama to wear, this turban to wear, this qameez to wear, this shawl to wear. So that's what he's referring to. Not that he gave it a name, but he took the name. Or he would start off by saying, this garment, oh Allah, all praises to you for giving it to me. So that was kind of the methodology. So many of us may read the dua when we have a new clothing. There's numerous duas about it. But this is something in addition that the Prophet ﷺ would do for some reason. Now, when you say he would take its name, he's not just going to say, oh, this is an imama. He'd say something like, رَزَقَنِ اللَّهُ هَذَا qamis." So he'd kind of mention that, oh, Allah's given me this new qamis to wear. Allah's blessed me with this new imama. That kind of a statement. So you can take the name of it in any way, shape or form. Not just take the name, but for a reason. So that's why the commentators are explaining, the muhaddithin, that, oh, Allah has given me this new cloth, these new trousers, this new shirt, these new shoes. So you'd say that and then you read the dua. Or you can, if you know Arabic, you can adjust the dua to include the name of the cloth that you're going to be wearing, the garment. Unless it's jeans. right? That's a joke. Now what does this dua mean? Allahumma lakal hamdu kama kasawtanihi. O oh Allah for you is praised. If I do a literal translation, O oh Allah for you is praised, is praised just as you have given me this to wear. So what exactly does that mean? What is that kaf there for? That just that word. So it's, it could be, O oh Allah all praises for you because of this clothing you've given me to wear or upon the fact that you've given me this so your all praise is due to you or it could be that you the happiness that you've brought me i'm praising you that much it could be all various different meanings the main thing is that it's the connection that the praise is being connected to the fact that you've been bestowed with this new piece of clothing and you're thanking allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for that now as'aluka khayrahu wa khayra ma suni alahu i ask you for the good of it and what it's made for and the evil of it uh, the, I seek refuge from the evil of it and the evil for which it is made. That needs to be understood. This is very comprehensive. And believe me, if you understand this, inshallah, we would, should be making this dua all the time because it's a very comprehensive, very far-reaching dua. Firstly, I ask you for the good of it. Meaning, the, the good of any clothing is what? That it remains durable. It remains in use for a long time. It doesn't wear out, it doesn't tear, and so on. It stays clean, it stays pure. Right? It stays, it fulfills your habit, sorry, it fulfills your need of why you're buying that cloth for, or that, that garment for. Also, it's f to fulfill a need and it's not for anything bad, like it's not to show off with, it's not to show arrogance with. Also that it be halal, it be halal uh, for you to use. And that is all the meaning of the best of this. The best of what it was made for could refer to why do why is our garments made? Normal garments. Not the ones on the catwalk, which are just crazy. Five people probably buy them. Or maybe a bit more. right? And then, you, then the poor designers have to work out a whole new wardrobe for the next year. I just feel sorry for them. Really. Because, I mean, who wears that kind of stuff on these thin individuals, human beings that you know, I'm, I hope nobody here is into that kind of stuff. May Allah protect us. Okay, d d don't point at anybody. Right. 
the, um, so why would you why why is a garment made it's obviously to fulfill needs for example to protect you in cold weather if it's a nice cold, if it's a nice thick woolen you know breathable uh, down filled jacket and so on it's for either to deal with the cold to deal with the hot the, the, the evil of it would be the opposite of that, that it be made from haram, that it be najis, that it doesn't remain for a very long time, it gets messed up very quickly, it gets worn out very quickly, it doesn't do its job, it doesn't fit properly. Subhanallah, you know, the fitting, the finishing isn't good on it, all of these things. Or that you wear it and then you use it for the wrong. You, you get bad intention, you start showing off, you start feeling uh, really cool about something because it's got a label on there or something. Things like that. Allah knows best. Do the dua and inshallah will be protected from all of these bad intentions or bad things that could come off it. Or that it doesn't fulfill what it's made for. I seek refuge from the evil of what it could be made for. Which means um, it doesn't protect you from cold or hot or the heat or whatever it is that you've brought it for. The other thing is that you're doing thankfulness from, for every limb that you're covering. All of these things are the benefit of it. The Prophet Sallallahu du'as were always very comprehensive. They just took everything into consideration. That's why you could never make up a du'a as comprehensive as Rasulullah's du'a. Because his reach, his understanding, his insight was just too far. Was very great, was very extensive. So you could just encompass all of that. Then he had the ability in his tongue to be able to say very extensive meanings in very few words. So who, who could beat him in that? You're talking about a prophet, the, 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 the ultimate servant of Allah, a prophet, and a messenger. So with all of that, can anybody come with anything greater than him? Impossible. Because he just had the experience and the qualifications, natural qualifications that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had given him for such a thing. Another thing is obviously that people respect, you know, show me respect, they don't consider me humiliated and so on, you know. So there's numerous things like that. Okay, a few other things here. Sometimes a garment may be very beloved to you, but you don't know that somebody's going to be so jealous of you because of it, right? That they would have hasad. They may do something. You could, you could pray this dua when you get a new car so that somebody doesn't come and scratch it up. And for women in their handbags, you should make the dua. You know, you spent three, four hundred pounds on a handbag, crazy amount, you know, that your phone isn't probably worth that much, <laughs> that you put inside it. They say the handbags are more expensive than what you put inside it. It's kind of weird, isn't it? Just because that is what you show everybody. LV, you know, or whatever it is that people wear. So if you do buy, you know, for a reason Allah's given you the money and you, you want to buy and whatever the case is, make sure you read this dua. Because it's very, you know, because it will be protected from any kind of evil, which means that it will protect you from the evil eye of others as well. Subhanallah, you just do that prayer once when you first get it and inshallah it should protect you for every time you wear it which is really good, which is really beneficial. I mean we can never stop talking about the comprehensiveness of that just one dua of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Now what is it that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would make dua for? How, what kind of duas would he make when he... Because this is only one hadith that gives us this understanding. There's one that's related from Ibn Majah and Hakim from Umar radiallahu an. That the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, whenever he would wear a new garment, he would say, Alhamdulillahi alladhi kasani ma uwari bihi awrati wa atajammalu bihi fi hayati. This is a very famous dua that's in the small collections of, of uh, Masnoon duas as well. That's another. It means all, all praises to Allah who gave me to wear that by which I conceal my naked areas with or my naked parts of the body with and by which I adorn myself in this world. So the Prophet ﷺ would make this dua as well. So he made different duas at different times. And then once he made this dua, he would make the dua before wearing the garment, not after wearing, before. Then he would go to the garment that he was replacing, the old one. And he would give sadaqah of it first. Right? He would give sadaqah. And it says that whoever makes this dua he will remain in the protection of Allah. Sorry, he would wear the garment and then he would make the dua and then he would immediately go and give the old one away. That's, it was the other way around. The main thing is that the person will be in the hifzullah, in the safety of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and in the veil of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
whether the person is alive or dead if he's made this dua. So there's great reward for making this dua. There's another dua that's related from Imam Ahmad and Abu Dawud and, and Hakim from, and Ibn Majah from Mu'adh and Anas radiallahu anhum. That whoever wears any garment and he says, Alhamdulillah ladhi kasani hadha wa razaqanihi min, ghawri, min ghayri hawli minni wa la quwa ghafar Allahu lahu ma taqaddam min dhambih. This is for any clothing. The other ones were for new clothing. This is for any garment when you wear it every day or any day. Oh, uh, uh, all praises to Allah who gave me this to wear. And he bestowed this upon me without much effort on my part or without the true ability on my part to have get, gotten it for myself. Because even if you had got a lot of money to buy it with, Allah is the one who gave you the money to start with. Whoever reads this dua on any garment when wearing, the new clo when wearing clothing, then... Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive for him all of his previous sins. Maybe the reason for such a great reward is that the, the, the point about remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when you're putting your clothing on. It's such a casual, common, uh, incidental thing you do every morning or, you know, that who's going to remember? If you remember, that means you seriously love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You seriously got some conscious uh, you know, attempt. So it, it'd be a very good idea for us to learn this dua. Uh, and, and to read it as many times as possible because all the previous sins are forgiven. And Abu Dawud uh, in the, in adds that uh, previous and later sins. And Allah knows best. Inshallah we carry on from hadith number 61 next time. But just to conclude, a uh, few things that we're going to try is our qamis, our jubbas that we wear should not be, be below the ankle. Likewise the izar should not be below the ankle. Um, and if somebody has the ability to get a special qamis designed, right? Uh, maybe these companies that make these, they should think about this. I'm surprised that nobody's really thought about it, right? Uh, either they've got a business mind but not a very sunnah thinking mind or the people who have a sunnah thinking mind don't have a business mind. I don't know, right? But to think about developing something that fits this description of the qamis of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But the main thing is, when we wear new clothing or any clothing, we've got the adab here. And to try to give sadaqah of our old clothing, something still we need to go into our wardrobes and check that out and do that insha'Allah. Allahumma anta salam wa minka salam tabarak diyad al-jalali wal ikram Allahumma ya hayyu ya qayyum bi rahmatika nastaghith jazallahu anna muhammadan ma huwa ahlu. Jazallahu anna Muhammadan ma huwa ahlu Jazallahu anna Muhammadan ma huwa ahlu Allahumma salli wa sallim ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa baraka wa sallama tasliman kathiran ila yawmiddin Allahumma gfir dhunubana wa mu'ayyubana Allahumma gfir lana wa rahamna wa aafina wa ahdina wa rzuqna Allahumma ahdina wa ahdibina wa jajalna hudatan liman ihtada Allahumma inna nasaluka al-afwa wa al-afiyata fi al-dini wa al-dunya wa al-akhira Allahumma inna nasaluka tamam al-afiyya wa dawam al-afiyya wa shukra ala al-afiyya Allahumma qawwi fi ridaqa da'fana Allahumma jajal akhira kalamina la ilaha illa Allah Allahumma ansur ikhwanana fi sabirik Allahumma ansur al-muslimin fi kulli makan fi al-sham wa fi filastin wa fi afghanistan في كل انحاء العالم اللهم احفظهم واحفظنا من البلاء والافات والمحن اللهم جنبنا الفواحش ما ظهر منها وما بطن اللهم ربنا هب لنا من ازواجنا وذرياتنا قرة اعين واجعلنا للمتقين اماما سبحان ربك رب العزه عما يصفون وسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين